Does your family ever get exasperated with you for stockpiling such things as paper towels, bottled water, or toilet tissue? Well, they certainly can't object to you stockpiling money. Silver, the only money recognized by the U.S. Constitution. And your first 10-ounce bar of pure silver can be had at spot price with no premium by going to sdbullion.com rp. And when you buy it that way, you'll be supporting reluctant preppers as well by going to sdbullion.com rp. Thanks. This is a quick update to thank you for building our number of patrons to 70 and growing on patreon.com slash reluctant peppers. Soon, when we reach 100 active patrons, we're going to start sending out a one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle each and every month to one active subscriber. So you don't want to miss out on that. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctant peppers. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have a first-time guest visiting us tonight. You may have heard his name before. He's Joe Bannister. He's a former IRS special agent for the Criminal Investigation Division of the IRS. He's an advocate for truth and honesty in taxation. He's here with us on Reluctant Preppers to answer your questions about taxation and how it affects you and your relationship to the government and your responsibility as a citizen and your freedom. Joe, thank you for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you, Donegan. Thanks for having me. We're delighted that you were able to come on. You were actually recommended to us by one of our viewers who said, please have you on the show and talk about this important topic. And I wanted to tell you that I've got a family connection. Uh, both of my parents were, uh, they're now deceased, but they were uh, tax resistors for a specific uh, reason having to do with war tax resistance. And um, they, they were members of the, uh, of the Quaker uh, community and, and uh, very concerned about really putting their money uh, where they felt that it was going to be ethical and moral as citizens. And I know that that's one consideration that, that people weigh very uh, closely, but a lot of other people are just uh, really concerned about the constitutionality and the legality and the politicization and a lot of other um, but sort of behavioral controls that have seeped into our uh, taxing system, tax system, as well as the complexity that makes it bewilderingly uh, out of touch to the ordinary individual. And if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about how you, <laughs> it's funny, I was going to ask you how, you how you got mixed up in all this, and I was going to realize <laughs> we're, we're all mixed up in all this, and you're the one who's trying to find the way out and are, and are being a, a uh, leader in communicating to others about what they need to be aware and informed so that they can make the right responsible choices. But would you tell us your story briefly on uh, how you got involved in this and, and why it became such a big part of your life? Sure, Dunnigan. And uh, I think that's a good way to put it, how I got mixed up in all this. Uh, I came from a family of uh, government servants, uh, had three younger, have three younger brothers and uh, two police officers and one firefighter. So at one time, we, uh, the Bannister brothers, there were four badges and three guns. Uh, our father served uh, in the city of San Jose, California, in the public works department. So uh, we couldn't have been considered anti-government or uh, you know anti-tax or any of these uh, monikers that uh, seemed to follow me around. Um, you know the evidence would show that uh, we actually were very pro-government uh, in the sense that there needs to be some level of government to serve, you know, the people's needs at, at a minimum to keep us safe. So uh, my other brothers were going into government service, um, as I say, mostly police and fire, or all police and fire. And I came to the table with an accounting degree and, uh, you know, more of a financial background and so I did look into a uniformed law enforcement um, career, but decided that perhaps, and nothing against uniformed law enforcement whatsoever, but that maybe having already achieved my degree and already earned a, a CPA, Certified Public Accountant Certificate, uh, that you know perhaps a, an investigative role might be better for me to pursue. So I applied to both the FBI and the IRS Criminal Investigation Division and I qualified for both positions, uh, but the FBI was literally waiting for
for an appointment letter to be sent to Quantico, Virginia, where the FBI trains its agents. Uh, but there was a hiring freeze. And this is back when Newt Gingrich was the Speaker of the House. So that'll give you some idea of how long ago that was. Uh, but due to a hiring freeze, I'm waiting and waiting, wanting the FBI to uh, appoint me to begin a career with the FBI. Meanwhile, the IRS Criminal Investigation Division, I also had made, made an application to. And they called me and asked me if I'd be interested in a special agent position with them. And basically, I, you know, I had my heart set on the FBI because yeah. at least back in the 90s and prior to that, the FBI had a much better reputation than it has today. Uh, but of course, the IRS has always had a bad reputation. <laughs> so, hmm. uh, but I decided that you know the FBI wasn't able to hire me, and various friends in law enforcement were saying, look, you know, if you get an offer, jump on the offer. You can always transition to another position later. So it was uh, August of 1993 when I was offered the position. Uh, interestingly enough, the IRS did a second background investigation on me. The FBI had already done a thorough background, and the IRS went and did a second one. So I passed that, uh, and by November <coughs> of 1993, I was sworn in uh, as an IRS special agent. And uh, people may not know uh, that the IRS has a criminal investigation division. Uh, today they refer to it as CI, or criminal investigation approximately 3,000 uh, special agents who are criminal investigators concentrating primarily on tax and money laundering investigations. Ah. So a special agent in the IRS is really, as far as the federal government is concerned, not very different from an FBI special agent, a Secret Service special agent. Uh, it's a particular designation called a GS-1811 series, so which means you carry a gun, uh, you have handcuffs, you make arrests, you do investigations, you investigate cases for trial, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just that the IRS's jurisdiction and authority was much narrower than an FBI agent concentrating primarily on taxation and money laundering crimes. So that's how you got in, but then something shifted the game for you so that uh, you became concerned enough to start uh, doing your own investigation into the system itself. What what led to that? Well, I, I did intend, uh, you know, the a law enforcement, a federal law enforcement career is 20 years. Uh, you work 50 hour work weeks, and I guess they figure they kind of uh, use you up within 20 years rather than a 30 year time frame. So I had a 20 year uh, career trajectory to be uh, looking at. And after about three years into my IRS career, I was listening to a talk radio show that I liked, an AM talk radio in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, believe it or not, it was a constitutionally minded uh, host and show. Uh, there are there are were a few of us uh, left in the Bay Area at that time. <laughs> and uh, so this uh, talk show host, Jeff Metcalf, was a former uh, Army Special Forces uh, colonel. Uh, you know, he's very reliable person, very honorable. Uh, he didn't care uh, who was right or wrong. It was uh, he more preferred to determine what was right or wrong, right. Uh, which I which I liked. And so I would listen to him while I would, you know, prior to work or on the way to investigate some um, some aspect of an of an investigation. And so he had uh, a woman on his show named D V Kid, K I D D. It's her last name spelled, D V Kid dot com for anyone who's going to check later. And DV was talking about the income tax, about the Federal Reserve, about these various issues that back in the 90s, uh, when less people were awake, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, uh, before the internet was really you know, hitting its stride, uh, talking about the Federal Reserve <laughs> or the income tax was like, ooh, this must be a kook. Uh, but she was on this show that had already established a great deal of credibility for me. So okay. when she started talking about the income tax, I thought, I think I need to look into this because either this show host that I thought was so reliable is not, or there's something wrong with the income tax, and that's not good either because here I am carrying this gun and badge around. You're part of that system, yeah. The IRS, right. So that begs the question, what did you find out when you started looking into some of those things that, that these 
uh, what's her name? Kid? Uh, D V D E V V Y. D V Kid. Okay. Uh, opened up for you. Well, uh, if I had any bias at all, it was really against what she said, yes. but I had, I wanted to check it out. So I spent two years uh, off duty, basically evenings and weekends while I continued to work as an IRS criminal investigator uh, throughout 1997 and 1998, um, you know, in, in, in and between being a soccer coach uh, with my kids and, you know, earning money to pay tuitions and the mortgage payment and all that. And just basically poking at what she said and, uh, going to the law library and looking deeper than my uh, accounting degree at San Jose State or my training for the CPA exam or my IRS training ever took me to in terms of depth and looking at original sources. Okay. And so um, I was surprised to learn after this two years that there was a lot of evidence that indicated that DV Kidd was, was correct, that basically the IRS, the Department of Justice, the mainstream media was lying to the American people about their federal income tax obligations. That the laws uh, as written do apply to some people in some circumstances, but the wide application to every American in almost every circumstance just wasn't true. And it was a difficult pill to swallow uh, to see that that was what the evidence was showing but I basically pursued this two-year period as, a, as an investigation. It was a personal investigation. I didn't ask the IRS for permission, uh, but I basically went and, and looked at the evidence, and it was quite compelling that the IRS very well was knowingly deceiving the American people and, and basically intimidating them into giving up their own money or stealing their money from them. In order to reach some of those conclusions and those breakthrough awarenesses that you did, was it necessary for you to uh, avail yourself of you know, channels of information or insight that you had from being inside the system that, that would not have been available to an ordinary person, just an uh, ordinary private citizen who just wanted to find out those same answers that you were going after? Uh, I'd say a little bit, like maybe 10%. Uh, 90% w with some digging would really be available to everyone. Uh, the 10% was basically the you know, what's something called the Internal Revenue Manual, and it's basically the manual that IRS agents use to do their job. So it gets very descriptive. It's thousands of pages, and it goes into every nook and cranny about what an IRS you know collection officer will do or how an IRS audit will be conducted or how an IRS criminal investigation will be conducted. So why am I not surprised that it's not just the tax code that's thousands of pages long, it's even the training manual, <laughs> manual for the that's employees. Right. Okay, go ahead, that's sorry, right. I, couldn't, I couldn't resist. No, that's, that's very true. <laughs> and of course, it's, uh, it makes it very difficult uh, for anyone to even decide that they're going to dig deeper. Because you know, digging deeper into thousands of pages uh, is really a, a Herculean task. Right. Uh, fortunately, what I brought to the table was, you know, I was a certified public accountant for a total of 15 years, uh, CPA, and I was a CPA prior to entering into the IRS, uh, unlike many of the agents who graduated from college and would just go directly into the IRS. Okay. I had a number of years uh, outside of the agency working for clients, uh, you know, being as diligent as you need to be uh, when you're an advocate for clients paying good money to make sure that you know every I is dotted and T crossed. So what were some of the findings specifically that, um, again, from that you had been intrigued by enough from that initial uh, radio show you heard from Mrs. Kidd uh, that, that you found had some v valid basis underneath them? You mentioned specifically one, and that is that perhaps the obligation to is it to pay and to file and pay taxes is not universal to all citizens, but only applies uh, to certain groups or something in certain situations? Were there other uh, concerns that you also dug into and found had basis as well? Well, one of the things that I'd like to keep, uh, like everyone to keep in mind, and I guess because I'm an accountant, C former CPA, former IRS agent, uh, you know, there are, there are dozens if not hundreds of different kinds of federal taxes. And so the federal income tax is just one of many federal taxes that are um, that are basically levied on you know certain people in certain circumstances. 
So um, what I found specifically related to the income tax, but part of it, of course, was to compare uh, the way the income tax is administered and enforced compared with all the other federal taxes. Okay. And so one of the principal uh, interesting factors is that, and this, this is something that's acknowledged by the courts, uh, appeals courts, is the U.S. Supreme Court, that in order for you to owe a tax, you have to be made liable for the tax, L-I-A-B-L-E. Sure. And, of course, the reason for that from a common sense perspective and from a legal perspective is there has to be someone who's ultimately responsible to pay the tax. Uh, giving you a quick example, uh, if we, you know, those of us that grew up and our parents might, you know, have a little glass of bourbon or something in the evenings, uh, they had a, a bourbon bottle in their bar and it, there was a tax that was paid on that bourbon. But our parents didn't get visited by the ATF and say, you need to pay this tax. The tax was built into the cost of the spirit, you know, as they call it, the, uh, the, the distilled spirit. Right. And so the, the parents who were drinking the little glass of bourbon didn't have to pay the tax. The tax was paid by the person who's liable to pay the tax, which was the original distiller, the person that made that liquid beverage into an adult uh, beverage. Okay. So, All right. And that just goes over and over and over again where someone has to be made liable to pay the tax. Okay. Well, when you look at the income tax, you find that the only place where the average American could possibly be made liable for the tax is if they are a withholding agent making a payment to a foreigner. <laughs> So, and I, you know, if, if people are taking any notes, if they go to subtitle A, because the Title 26, the Internal Revenue Code, this big, thick book with thousands of pages that we've been talking about, okay, and you hunt for the word liable, which nowadays we can do on the internet, right? We can right. hunt for the word liability, liable, and you can hunt through the entire, entire Internal Revenue Code looking for that. And you should look in subtitle A because that's where the income tax sections or, or portion of the Internal Revenue Code is. Okay. So look in subtitle A. You can look at any subtitle, A, B, C, D, and on. But look in subtitle A and look for the word liable or liability. And what you'll find is these very narrow circumstances where, let's say I was a, a concert promoter and I was going to pay a... Uh, Andrea Bocelli, you know, the, the famous Italian singer, he was going to come and do a concert. Well, as far as I know, he's an Italian citizen, but he wants, you know, half a million dollars to have a concert one night. If I pay him, I'm very likely going to be liable for an income tax on a portion of that payment. Hmm. So that would be just a, you know, quick and dirty example of where an American could possibly be liable for the income tax. But if you compare that to the average American's circumstances, yeah. you're not involved with any foreigners, you're a, you know, a butcher at the local grocery store, you're a truck driver, uh, you're a business person, and you simply have uh, you know, revenue and expenses, uh, you're basically trying to subsist, you're trying to survive, maybe get a ahead a little bit. Uh, but there's no liability section that was ever passed by Congress uh, that makes the average American liable in the, in the manner that I've been describing. And it's you'll further find that it's not an oversight, like some kind of loophole. Okay. <laughs> that actually, uh, after the in 1913, of course, the 16th Amendment uh, came into being, and there's really solid evidence to show that it was never ratified. But the courts have dismissed the evidence and not want to basically evaluate the evidence showing that it wasn't ratified. So we can just pretend that it was ratified or consider it ratified. The fact of the matter is that the Supreme Court has ruled over and over again that the 16th Amendment did not expand federal taxing power. And where this came into, real, into uh, focus was in 1916 in a case called the Bruchaber case like brush and then A-B-E-R, Bruchaber. Okay. And uh, this is where one of many times when the Supreme Court said that the 16th Amendment did not expand federal taxing power. Okay. Now, the basic 
uh, thrust of the 16th Amendment was that the people who wanted it intended to tax everyone. They basically intended it to be the way it is today, <laughs> where everybody thinks they owe, you know, practically everything in their wallet. Yeah. Uh, but in 1916, the Supreme Court basically slapped down the Congress uh, as they passed laws according to the 16th Amendment and said, whoa, you guys are going way too far because all those uh, restraints that are in the Constitution are still there, even after the 16th Amendment. And so what the Congress did, uh, complicit with the IRS, was that they backtracked and they basically made these very narrow circumstances where certain people would be liable for the income tax, but it was primarily focused on uh, non-resident aliens and foreign corporations, not Americans. And so you have to go back, and of course the IRS will use the paper trail, right, to to go after the bad guys or the people that they claim are bad guys, uh, relating to their their tax income taxes. Sure. But you need to actually go back and look at the IRS's paper trail. Okay. Look back at the Congress's paper trail, and you'll find that there's been uh, basically a cover up in um, enabling or making the American people believe that the income tax applies to their everyday circumstances. You bet we do. When in fact, you look at the law, the, the statutes, the regulations, and even the Supreme Court cases, and you find that that's not the case. But unfortunately, like we discussed, it's it was difficult enough for me as a you know one-time CPA and IRS criminal investigator to do that level of digging. So it's not impossible for people, and I don't want to discourage them from you know studying and beginning the, the process, but it's difficult and of course part of my mission is to try to make it easier for people to get a handle on these topics to even know where to look and but to show them as much proof as possible so they don't have to take my word for it uh, they can just take the facts uh, and view them for themselves before we move on uh, could you help us understand what your best understanding is of, of the motivation of the, you said there were the pe people at the time, whether it was the Federal Reserve or whether it was the banks or whatever, who wanted, or the government that wanted people, they wanted taxation to become more universal. Um, mm -hmm. But why would they have done these special, which almost sound like loophole cases of, okay, it only applies in this case and in this case, in this case, were those like considered just sh palatable to just get it to stick on the books and then, then it could be confusingly uh, portrayed to most people like everybody was liable as long as you could keep that that taxation out there at all or, or what, what what's your understanding of the motivation behind those special cases um, well I think uh, you're, you're you're pretty pretty darn close uh, of course I can't read the minds of people back in 1910 and unless there was a paper trail where they, they said in their little emails to each other oh no there was no email yeah, all right <laughs> right right uh, but you know you can definitely tell <clears throat> by a lot of the literature that was going on in the time the fights that were going in in congress to get the 16th amendment and then the initial law that was passed the uh, income tax act of 1913 that the intention was to just go out and grab as much taxes as possible and it was only this 1916 case that made them have to put on the brakes because it was a Supreme Court case. And if the Supreme Court says you've overstepped your bounds, well, it, you know, at least back then they were saying, okay, well then, so they, they being the Congress, the Treasury Department, they all backtracked and they backtracked into a, um, an area or, or a circumstance that they knew would be constitutional. And that would be basically to tax foreigners. Ah and tax Americans in very limited circumstances if say they were traveling abroad for an extended period of time to work or you know there was some kind of an international connection to what the American was doing okay but the thing that they definitely got rid of was that the average American living and working in the United States was made liable to pay the income tax so what happened after that that caused that to not be implemented in that way because as you described Everybody who gets a wage, every wage earner is, uh, when they are even applying for their job, they have to give their social security number and they know that their taxes are going to be uh, withheld from their, from their wages that they're paid. So how did we get from point A to point B? Well, uh, one, of the, one of the ways was from 1916 when there was this backtracking until World War II, the 
the tax wasn't you know that widely applied just because it you know getting it to be enforced or getting really traction it takes time but once world war ii came and came and went and then there was a lot of uh, i guess you basically couldn't call it anything else other than pro propaganda you know even donald duck and walt disney got involved uh with the you know patriotism was the reason that everyone should begin to start withholding from their paychecks so if you can believe it it wasn't until after world war ii was something called the victory tax where withholding became uh, you know um so widely used across hmm. the country. And, and was this was the appeal to the individuals or was this to employers to start withholding from their employees or how did that how did that implementation of that change take up, take place? And it, and it was it was both. I mean if if people go to hearliberty.com for example there's a lot of audio and video um media there and one of them is a, this Donald Duck cartoon from the 40s where Disney got involved in trying to stir up uh, this a patriotic feeling which I've got nothing against patriotic feelings but they were stirring it up so that businesses would withhold from their employees and employees if their business wasn't doing it would you know volunteer and just this was this patriotic effort to pay the debts of the war that everyone should get on board and make sure that they're withholding tax from their paychecks. So if people look up, you know, for later the Victory Tax, uh, Victory Tax Act, and this World War II, uh, you know, Here Liberty H E A R Here Liberty dot com, okay, and watch the Don the Donald the Donald Donald Duck, you can begin to learn a little bit more about the the fervor and the fever that was being, you know, cultivated at that time to massively get the American people into a withholding system, uh, which the IRS refers to as a pay-as-you-go system. Uh, and then, of course, from generation to generation, people are not, well, the ma mainstream media isn't telling people no. that this is going on. Even the lawyers and the whatever the CPAs were called back in the 30s and 40s uh, aren't, aren't telling the public, and they're, largely aren't learning it themselves, not out of any kind of um, uh, you know, lack of ability or desire, but how many people dig into law books in the law library to that extent to be able to find this, this fraud, this deceit that's been going on since 1916? Well, most people don't like taxes. Um, uh, even back in the day, uh, Will Rogers and others complained about them and so on, but... Um, uh, what's the deal where it became the common knowledge or the, I guess you just say commonplace uh, conventional wisdom was if you don't pay your taxes you're going to prison so when did the teeth show up to start enforcing laws that don't exist well of course there's the um, famous Al Capone case and I'm sure most Americans have somehow some way whether it's in a commercial or on the news or some uh, you know investigative show they'll talk about al capone and how only the irs could get al capone right uh so there's just these little little pavlovian you know kind of conditioning mechanisms over the years and then of course like i'm sure most people are like me my parents the, the reason that i started to file tax returns when i was 12 was because i had a paper route and i began to earn money and somebody told me I have to get a social security number <laughs> and somebody told me I have to, you know, prepare this tax return so that I can get some money back. And and so it's really the blind leading the blind. I mean, my parents paid attention to things as best they could. But of course, at that time, they were, you know, in the 60s, the 70s, uh, they're only learning from Dan Rather and Tom Brokaw and Peter Jennings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they sure weren't telling them that. Uh, so everybody's just following along with what they've been told to do and it wasn't really till I was in the in a, a role of investigating people and if they were guilty seeing two that they were put in prison yes that I felt that I of, of anybody had an obligation to look into this and see okay if it's BS if it's not true then so be it and and I'm gonna squawk about the people that are lying about it right but by the same token 
I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution as an IRS criminal investigator. And once I found out that it was actually the IRS that was the, the liars and the deceivers and the cheaters and the stealers, I, I spoke up about that. And of course, that's why I, I lost my job at the IRS. So you did this while still employed by the IRS. I mean, I know yes. you did the research. I didn't know you started speaking out. That's, uh, that's very courageous of you. Well, I really just, it was, it was a duty thing. I mean, I, of course, prayed about it a lot, thought about it. And what, what should I do now that I'm, at least the evidence as I've seen it, indicates that there's some really nasty things going on here. And I basically thought about, you know, the, the Ten Commandments, about the, the commandment to not bear false witness against your neighbor. I thought about my oath to support and defend the Constitution. I thought about the Treasury Rules of uh, Conduct, which clearly spelled out that if you find these kinds of issues, you're supposed to speak up. It's your duty. So uh, after thinking about those, I realized that I should, you know, quietly, calmly confront my supervisors at the IRS and show them what I had found and ask them to show me if I had made a, an error somewhere along. Yes. Uh, because I, you know, I'm not a Supreme Court justice or a, you know, Judge Napolitano or anybody like that, but I, IRS special agent, they trusted me to carry a gun and a badge around even on airplanes at the time, a uh, certified public accountant, uh, and somebody who, like I say, if I had any bias at all, it wasn't like some bias against the IRS, uh, and yet still the evidence was showing some really you know, illegal, nasty, deceitful things going on. So the response that I got from my supervisors was, this, was that they would not answer my questions, they would not address any of my concerns, and that they would give me the paperwork necessary to tender my resignation. So they didn't fire me, but they did send me home for one week of administrative leave. They refused to address any of my concerns. And so a week after they sent me home, I decided that the best thing for me and for everyone was that I do resign because if I had stayed th there, they could have tried to destroy an otherwise sterling reputation, if I do say so myself. And also that I was very restricted as to what I could say. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have the same kind of First Amendment rights as a government employee that you do as a, as a private citizen. Okay. So I really felt that the, the best I could really do was to simply quit the job, resign. So I penned a quite a long resignation letter that's available uh, on my website for free if anybody would like to read it. If, can I give out the website? Yeah, please, please. Uh, agentfortruth.com. And I wrote this resignation letter basically explaining that I had gone to bat for the agency, that I had, uh, you know, the income, to, basically gone to bat for the status quo. I right. mean, <laughs> I didn't have any problem with it. It seemed to be kind of nasty to people now and then, but uh, that I tried my best to evaluate the evidence. And it looked to me like there were some really suspicious things going on. And I felt that the IRS uh, personnel, my supervisors, had the same duty as I did to do something about it. And their response was, we're not going to do anything about it. We're not going to address your concerns and you should hit, hit the road. You know, here's your hat. What's the hurry? There's the door. And, and they showed me the door. So that was back in, uh, it was February 25th, 1999, uh, which is actually my birthday. Uh, also the February 25th is the birthday of the 16th amendment. So, uh, Believe it or not, my birthday and the 16th Amendment's birthday are the same day, February 25th. <laughs> That's remarkable. So, uh, so anyway. where, where did the story lead from there? If you could just zoom us uh, closer to the conclusions that you reached f that you think the ordinary person, the ordinary uh, wage earner, the ordinary homeowner, the landowner needs to be aware of. Um, uh, because we've certainly heard, you're not alone, there are others who have expressed concern uh, publicly about the constitutionality or of the federal income tax and some of those uh, uh, got sent I, I taught were told their 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 law cases were dismissed as frivolous or they were perhaps imprisoned or some of them uh, met uh, untimely ends so people a lot of people have gotten the idea that well, whether it's true or not, it's a bad idea to, to try to take any action on it because you know bad things happen to people who do. But uh, what what advice can you give the average person about? Here's you need to know this. You need to know this truth, and here's how what you can actually do about it. Um, what kind of things come to mind in that regards? 
You've made a, a number of really excellent points. I'll try to expand upon a, a, a few of them as best I can remember. But I might first point out, because you brought up about your parents, that unfortunately, as much I'm sure there are so many uh, moral Americans who are, you know, they shiver just at the thought of where their tax money is going. Sure. And I and I don't blame them. But people should keep in mind that having a moral re or moral reason or not wanting to pay the tax because of the immoral purposes, uh, you can't use as a defense. Right. And you may very well you may very well already know that. Yeah. But it might be good to emphasize to your viewers that you can't use that as a defense. So if you're going to have any kind of defense, I'd start with learning that it's actually <laughs> a scam in the manner in which they're, you know, administering and applying it. Okay. If a separate or a an additional issue is the morality, I mean, we're all capable of moral thinking or immoral thinking and so there's nothing I'm not saying there's anything wrong with recognizing immoral things that are done with the tax money, but just so people know, you know, using it as a defense, there's all kinds of trouble with that because they'll try to just strip you of that defense. Very good. Uh, the other thing is, of course, the IRS, uh, for all that I might have to say about it or the evidence might have to say, it's still out there. It's still rocking people's worlds, uh, you know, seizing money from their paychecks, seizing their bank accounts. Uh, my principal mission, I believe, is to, you know, we're all potential jurors. We all could be put on a jury. And the government relies on the, the fact that most Americans, you know, where they get their news and who they talk to at, at the coffee shop have no idea that this is the truth. And so when the government tells them that this stuff is all BS, well, they haven't looked. So they'll believe the people that say that. So I encourage people to become more informed jurors. And even if they themselves don't serve on a jury, they may have woken up someone who will, who will end up serving. And, you know, slavery, one of the ways that slavery was pushed into the dustbin of history was because of juries. They were refusing to, uh, to convict people who were championing, you know, moving on past this, the slavery, you know, part of our, of our history. And so they were being convicted as, you know, harboring slaves yeah. and doing all this stuff. And it was juries not convicting that was a big reason why, you know, adding a lot of uh, uh, oomph, shall we say, to the movement. Uh, because if people aren't going to prison anymore and they're not going because of informed juries, then that's an injustice that went away. No thanks to the judiciary, you know, who ruled that a black person wasn't a person. Uh, no thanks to the Congress, but uh, thanks to regular Americans serving on juries who said this is not a, a crime, you know, to help a fellow human being. Let me just interject. So just to clarify for myself and maybe for others, you mentioned uh, the letter of the law as it was passed back in the 16th Amendment or the way it was reformulated or whatever to only had very narrow categories that did not say for example, that all wage earners were subject to are liable for payment of uh, federal income tax. But have, is it true that numerous people have been imprisoned or had their wages stripped from them or, or their savings or their paychecks or whatever because of non-payment of federal income tax? Yes, absolutely. They're, like I say, the 800-pound gorilla is out there stepping on people and sitting on them so they can't breathe and uh, you know starving them into submission. So I'm not that's why I'm not an advocate or out there, you know, pushing people's buttons and saying, why are you still filing and paying? Uh, that's just not my message because I don't think it, you know, my conscience can't take telling somebody, hey, go out into battle and, you know, here's a, a pea shooter or here's a slingshot, <laughs> you know, when they need an AR-15 or something. So, so but, but still there's a leap there from uh, the propaganda, the, the, uh, the, uh, patriotic propaganda post-World War II about, come on, bite the bullet, sacrifice, do the good thing for your, your country and everything, get us back on our feet again, all this sort of thing. So that's all well and good, but how does that change into people are going to prison for not doing that? There's a big leap there. And usually we always are taught that, that when the courts make decisions, they make them based on precedent, but if the precedent was based on nothing, I mean, how did that, how did that get started? 
Uh, well, that's a very intuitive question uh, for sure. Uh, basically, they when you're conv- when you're um, charged with a tax crime, one you know maybe most of your viewers are well of something called the elements to the crime. There has to be two, three, four particular aspects of your conduct that actually tick off the boxes that make you guilty of a crime. So for for income tax evasion um, or failure to file a tax return, one of the elements is that there was an additional tax due and owing. So in other words, there's proof that you actually owed the tax. Well, what happens is the, the federal judiciary in particular will tell the jury, well, the prosecutor doesn't need to show you that there was an additional tax or what law you know, enabled the assessment of the tax. I'm telling you as the judge, there was an additional tax due and owing. So basically the judge takes that completely off the table for the jury to decide, well, was there really a tax due and owing? Was the person liable for this tax as the you know Internal Revenue Code requires? Uh, yeah, no, it's it's pretty sick. <laughs> if you start to look, it's it's so people are railroaded, you know, in my, in my opinion. But people are railroaded. They do end up uh, going to prison. One thing I will say though is when the IRS loses, uh, you know, they tried to prosecute me in 2005, uh, four felony counts that probably would have sent me to federal prison for about five years. And I was acquitted of all those charges because they were trumped up, uh, no pun intended, trumped up from the beginning. Bogus charges, they made up bogus evidence, and thankfully the jury was paying attention and could see that the government was trying to railroad yet another you know, whistleblower, another person, into prison. Uh, not everyone is, is that fortunate, but there are others. There's a, an attorney named Tom Cryer, C-R-Y-E-R, He's deceased, but he also was prosecuted um, prosecuted for income tax evasion and willful failure to file. And before the trial, the government dropped the evasion charge because they were already afraid before they even got to trial that they weren't going to be able to prove that. And then Tom was also acquitted of the willful failure to file charge. So and there, there are many other examples Um Vernie Kuglin was a FedEx pilot, uh, and she was acquitted of, of all the char- criminal charges against her. Now, the IRS, after the criminal trial, uh, tried to chew her up civilly with audits and collection matters. And, you know, like I say, that 800-pound gorilla got plenty of stamina, <laughs> and it's there to just keep on grinding on people. So I'm not trying to say that they're not, but they do lie about their, you know, 100% effective or that everybody goes down. Uh, that's not the case. They actually either lie or don't tell you about many of the cases where they've lost. And the reason that the IRS has lost has been because when they really are uh, required to put up or shut up, they can't put up. You know, if the, if the judge isn't able to help them win the case, if the jury's paying attention, uh, if the defendant, uh, you know, has some decent knowledge and can get up on the witness stand and defend themselves and they have good attorneys to help them present a good defense, uh, the IRS is, is a paper tiger. So I don't, everyone I tell is, look, unless you've done, you know, two, three, four years of study or more, don't even think about taking on the IRS, but please, please educate yourself. Uh, try to be an informed American, an informed potential juror and realize that this country wasn't made to have political prisoners. And I didn't want to be part of creating more political prisoners by being an IRS special agent. And I don't, I don't think most Americans want to take part in that either. So it's really just about studying. And I hope that you know people go to agentfortruth.com. There's a part of the website called What's This All About? And there I try to lay out very simply. You know, there's no fees. There's no anything. It's just read follow the links and decide for yourself if there's some you know satisfactory factual information there two things come to mind one is uh when we were talking about how for the last decade or two or three people have complained about how litigious our society is and how how uh, it caught, increases difficulties and costs for everybody and and uh they said well one of the reasons it countries that aren't that don't have that problem is because 
uh, they have like a loser pays. If you go sue somebody else and you lose, then you, you have to pay the court fees, that sort of thing. Here, you made, it, you made the case where uh, the one individual you mentioned was basically about to get railroaded in this courtroom, but then got showed that, that this was false basis, false information, false claims, all that sort of thing. And it would have been a nice time to turn the tables around and go, okay, now the witness can leave the stand and now the prosecutors need to get on the stand because they're the ones who were really were doing, doing the malfeasance here. Um, yes. But we haven't seen no, that. Another very good point. <laughs> Does that ever the, happen? The, you the, well, the, the problem is that the IRS, the majority of the damage that they do to the American public is in, on a civil basis, yeah. not a criminal. True. And by civil, I mean audits, you know, people mm -hmm. going after your paycheck, yep. that kind of thing. And the IRS can do almost all of that without ever going to court. True. So this, I and guess the last question I wanted to really drive home, because I'm sure our, our viewers are just aching to hear you give them. So you, you've clearly made a, a call for people to educate themselves. You've clearly made the, the call for people, and maybe it's kind of analogous, but this is an actual virtuous patriotic call, is become educated enough that you can be a, a, a well-informed uh, and competent juror should, should the opportunity arise. Mm -hmm. Is there more to it than that, though? Can, is there some insights for actions and choices that are facing people that they will arrive at if they start to down this path of, of self-education that you advocate? Uh, very much, and again, I mean, I've got a lot of links on my website. It may, there may not be time to really go in, but I mean, uh, things like, you know, people ought to be advocating to keep cash around and being used yep. in society. <laughs> right. Because the, the way they're going, you won't have any property outside uh, in your own possession. Right. All of your property will be in the possession of a third party who will lickety split hand it over to the IRS. So from a property rights standpoint, I would encourage people, you don't necessarily have to get paid in cash because that then that arouses suspicion, but spend some cash. Go to the ATM and <laughs> spend cash. Don't let the powers that be that monitor all this stuff figure, you know what, we only have 20% of the population left that still uses cash, and now it's 16%, and now it's 8%, right. and then they can lower the boom. Um, so, of course, that and from a property standpoint and also from a surveillance standpoint, everything you do electronically can so easily be monitored and shut down and shut down that's right so uh you know certainly from a preparation standpoint uh i think that using cash and again more on the expense end than like i'm not encouraging people oh, go out and start getting paid fifty thousand dollars a year in cash okay but your spending can be done in cash and uh you know really be aware not only of the, the good you're doing in just using cash, but of the additional um, privacy aspects. If you get $300 out of your ATM, or let's say you're gonna buy a, you know, a, a knife or a weapon or some kind of a preparatory material, and you gotta do four ATMs, well, that doesn't go on anybody's report. And meanwhile, you can buy that that safe uh, underground safe or whatever it is you want and no one will know that that's what you bought except you and the vendor who sold it to you so i think there's multiple reasons why we should try to use cash while we still can and encourage others to do that too because i'm sure you and everyone has gone to the store and you see all the millennials and even people our age Absolutely. and older using the debit card and just yep. like, oh, it's not working? Well, and they look for their wallet for a second one, but what if they don't have one? <laughs> They're not gonna eat that night. So that's probably the biggest one that I, I is a big, uh, a big thing for me, is that I can see how they're trying to get us to a cashless society as soon as possible. Certain countries are already there. Um, certain airlines, you can't even deal with cash at all. They will not accept cash uh, as a medium of exchange. So even though these, the cash is, of course, Federal Reserve notes, and that's a whole oh, Good for all, story. That's yeah, public and private. Um, what about the more uh, other elephant? You mentioned the 800-pound gorilla. Okay, what about the elephant in the room? And that is, if we are not legally liable by the Constitution or the 16th Amendment to it, or the Supreme Court decisions that surrounded that, unless the, in these particularly narrow situations of paying to a foreigner and that sort of thing, then why should each of us continue to file and pay income tax, federal income tax on our ordinary wages? 
Well, the principal reason why we're we're stuck, or at least more of us have to get in the boat and you know help to row it, is that even if you or I uh, or the average person doesn't tell the IRS via a tax return, you know what they made, well, the IRS still gets the information, don't they? They get a W two that's sent to them from the place where you work. You know, if you're a W two wage yeah. earner. Yeah. Uh, if you're a contractor or an insurance broker and you get a 1099, uh, the IRS still learns what you earned that year, even if you don't tell them. Mm -hmm. So another big problem that, again, is only going to take more of us educating ourselves is whether or not this withholding of from the paycheck is required in the first place. Uh, whether or not, which of course it isn't, but that's the way that society runs. Mm -hmm. So in the same way that, you know, I don't have anything against smokers, but compare people who smoked in the 50s to people who smoke today. The, the population has diminished substantially because of just an awareness and a choice to not, not as many people smoke. Okay. So, I mean, people can, can educate, you know, their friends and neighbors, their family, and eventually, of course, I'm always hopeful that the American people can take charge of how they're taxed because <laughs> since the government is supposed to be of, by, and for the people, uh, that then it should work that way. But, of course, it's going to take a lot more of us to get in, like I say, and row the boat and, and let, let the Congress know we're on to the scam. We don't want to take on the IRS one-on-one. -on -one, so we're all going to do it together, us and you, 535 elected people. Well, we've been speaking with Joe Bannister, a former IRS special agent for the criminal investigation of the IRS. He has a website, agentfortruth.com. He is encouraging all of us to go check it out and look at the free educational materials there that will reveal, should we pay attention long enough, that the ordinary American citizens for their earned wages should not be liable to pay uh, federal income tax on those. And the more informed we become, the more we can help each other to write the, what's been wrong and been perpetrated for over a century now on our fellow Americans. Joe, thank you so much for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers for this first time. My pleasure, Donegan. Thanks for having me.